Well, it's a very great pleasure to be here, and may I add my welcome to all of you to our wonderful chemistry center, if you haven't been here before. Uh, this is a series, of course, of, of the lectures associated with the International Year of Chemistry, where there are events taking place throughout the world in celebration. And tonight, it has not escaped your notice that the subject of the lecture is Robert Boyle. And there can be nobody who studied science who is not familiar with the name uh, of Robert Boyle. Um, Boyle's Law, I think I was first introduced to myself at age 11, uh, and I've never forgotten it. I, it just shows the earlier you learn science, the, the more it sticks. So I, I'm not going to anticipate Duncan's lecture by telling you a lot about Robert Boyle, except to say that uh, he was an Irishman, he he uh, was son of an Irish, uh, wealthy Irish landowner. Uh, there is a connection with Burlington House, in fact, in that his brother purchased Burlington House and lived here until he died. So you're actually on premises which were um, part of the Boyle legacy, if you like. So it's a very appropriate uh, venue to have this lecture. And tonight we are particularly fortunate in having as our lecturer one of the great enthusiasts for Boyle uh, in the United Kingdom, Duncan Thorpe and Burns. Uh, Duncan uh, has had a very long association with the, uh, the Ross side of chemistry. He is currently uh, Honorary Senior Research Fellow and Emeritus Professor of Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, he was Professor of Analytical Chemistry there from 1975 to 1999, and prior to that was in Loughborough University of Technology and, and other places uh, going back into, into the midst of time. He is the author of 420 papers. Uh, he is the author and co-author or editor of 13 books. And his achievements in terms of being recognized as a, a, one of the foremost analytical scientists in, in, in the world is, is uh, I, would take me all night to read them, so I'm not going to try. I'll, I'll pick out a few which are relevant to the RSC. Uh, he was, of course, president of the analytical division of RSC from 1988 to 90. Uh, he uh, was the Theophilus Redwood lecturer uh, in 1982. He had the Analytical Reactions and Reagents Medal and Award of the RSC in 1984, uh, the Analog Gold Medal and Lecture uh, uh, BDH uh, RSC in 1990, the SAC Gold Medal uh, in 1993, Tertiary Chemistry Educational Medal and Award of the RSC in 1995, uh, and in 2009, and I know he was very pleased by this, uh, the Medal and Award for Outstanding Contribution to RSC Analytical Sciences Activities. He was a Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in 1976. Actually, it wasn't. It was a Fellowship of the Royal Institute of Chemistry then, and I happen to know that because 1976 was when I became a Fellow also, so uh, we have the same year in common. So he is, has an extremely distinguished scientific career, uh, and uh, he has been a good friend to the Royal Society of Chemistry uh, throughout his life. And we are very grateful uh, to him for agreeing to come and give this lecture on Robert Boyle. Duncan. Thank you very much, President, for that uh, courteous introduction. I think you and I go back a little bit further than many, and having sat at meetings at Imperial College in the midst of time almost, making what I think were very successful appointments, I think you agree. Well, we're here today to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the publication in August, almost to the day, in 1661, in London of Boyle's famous book. Here is Boyle, and here is Boyle's famous book. And this was shown in the April edition of Chemistry World, this particular illustration. The lecture material is divided into five sections. His life and times may be conveniently divided into seven periods the Irish childhood, school at Eton, holidays at the manor of Stalbridge, the Grand Tour, study and work at Stalbridge, 
the Oxford period, and finally in London. Robert Boyle was born the 25th of January, 1627, in Lismore Castle in County Waterford. And here we have Lismore Castle as it is today. At the time of Boyle, it wasn't castellated. The, the tops of, of all the towers were put on in the Victorian restoration. However, part of the castle exists today exactly as it was at the time of Boyle. And you can, this, is, this is rather, rather nice. This is the gatehouse, and it is the part which didn't get uh, messed about with. He was the 14th child and the seventh and last son of Richard Boyle, the first or great Earl of Cork, and of his wife, Lady Catherine Fenton. Boyle's autobiographical sketch, The Count of Philatris, during his minority, covers the first four periods. It is included in the first collected works of Boyle by Thomas Birch, published in 1744. The account was written sometime in 1648. Robin, or Robert, Robin to the close family was raised as was the tradition at that time in wealthy families by a wet nurse, in other words, a foster mother. He was then taught by private tutors at home, Robert at the age of eight, along with his brother Francis, who was 12, was sent to Eton. It is reported that he was a good student. Some holiday time was spent at the manor of Stalbridge, Dorset, which was purchased by the great Earl in 1636. After leaving school and a brief stay in the House of Savoy in London, he and Francis were sent under the charge of Isaac Marcoombs to undertake a grand tour in Europe. Marcoombs had earlier dealt with the grand tour for Robert's elder brothers, Lewis and Roger. However, just before departure, Francis was married to Elizabeth Killigrew, a maid of honor at the court. King Charles I gave the bride away. Four days later, Francis was separated from his bride and sent to the continent. According to the Earl, it was never too soon to think about a good match. Only two of the Earl's children escaped, only because the Earl had not completed the arrangements at the time of his death. When Robert was a mere 14 years old, and indeed out of the country, the Earl rode out to Hatfield and presented a gold and diamond ring to Lady Anne, the charming daughter of Lord Howard of Esrick. This was a pledge that she would become the wife of his youngest son. In his will, the Earl left a wealth of silver plate for her if, and only if, she married Robert. Upon return from the Grand Tour, Robert made no serious attempt to follow his father's lead with the Howards. Probably because he had witnessed too many loveless marriages. The ring was returned, and in due course, Lady Anne married her cousin, Charles Howard, later the first Earl of Carlisle. The years 1638 to 1644 were spent in making the Grand Tour. They got as far south in, in, as Italy and spent some time in Rome studying the works of Galileo apart from seeing some sites. Two years were spent in Geneva where much time was devoted to mathematics and various language studies. One summer in 1640 whilst in Geneva Robert awoke to find himself in the midst of a violent thunderstorm and he began to wonder why he had not been struck by lightning. He came to the conclusion that God must have reserved some special task for him. Thereafter, he dedicated himself to the demonstration of God's majesty by unraveling the secrets of nature. He was a devout Christian all the rest of his days. Upon his return to England in mid-1644, Robert lived with his widowed sister, Viscountess Ranelagh, before moving to Stalbridge Manor which is here, which is part of his inheritance from his father. 
This house was unfortunately, uh, this is as it was in 1812, it was demolished in 1822. Here he sat out the Civil War and the early Commonwealth period and started on his largely self-taught career of chemical and physical experimentation. He was, however, back and forth to London and intimate with the Invisible College, a circle of friends, which is the embryo of the Royal Society. Boyle was back in Ireland in 1652 to 1654, dealing with family estate matters. In a letter to Frederick Claudius, written from Ireland, Boyle was the first to use the term chemical analysis in the way it has since been used by chemists. This was first noted in 1978 in Dublin during the opening lecture at Euroanalysis 3. Boyle moved to Oxford in 1656 and lived in a house known as Deep Hall. And Deep Hall is on the west side of University College. And here we have the house in more detail. This, of course, is like all his residences, now demolished and part of the college. In Oxford, Boyle worked privately with paid assistants such as Robert Hooke, mainly to provide proofs of the corpuscularian, the mechanical theory of nature. He studied some aspects of medicine. Life in Oxford was quite congenial. Many of the invisibles were resident in that city. Boyle's last move was to London in 1668 so as to be near the Royal Society, of which he was a founder member. The move should have been made earlier, but was delayed due to the plague of 1665. He lived the rest of his days with his sister in Pall Mall, next door but one to Nell Gwynne, until, yes, the king's mistress, in 1691. And here we have a portrait of his uh, beloved sister. His sister's house and land included a laboratory which was designed by Robert Hooke and built for Robert. The site of the house is now the far right-hand side of the RAC club in Pall Mall. Robert Boyle died 31st of December 1691, seven days after the death of his beloved sister Catherine. He was buried close to his sister in the chancel of the church of St. Martin in the Fields, Westminster, on the 7th of January, 1692. Surprisingly, in view of their social importance, no memorial appears to have been erected to Robert or his sister in the church where they are buried. When the old church was demolished in 1721, no systematic record was made of the disposal of the bodies that had been buried there. The present church, St. Martin's in the Field, was erected between 1721 to 1724. It contains no memorial to Robert or his sister, nor their remains. Thus, Robert Boyle's final resting place is unknown. Before discussing Boyle's contributions to various branches of scholarship in which he was involved, it might be helpful to indicate the nature of his written records and publications. Most of these are now readily available thanks to Michael Hunter's editorial activities on the complete works of Boyle, Boyle's correspondence, and an excellent guide to the archive at the Royal Society, and also with his work with the Robert Boyle electronic project. Reading Boyle's works requires an amount of persistence and dedication, for as Lynn Thorndike put it, Boyle is notorious for having one of the most tiresome literary records on record. It is diffuse and rambling, apologetic and deprecatory, and without terminal facilities. Another detriment to the perusal of Boyle's writings is their over-elaborate and confusing subdivision into books, parts, essays, discourses, sections, titles, chapters, observations, and whatnot, to say nothing of the profuse preliminary prefaces by the publisher and indeed by the author. 
A number of his books are written in the format of a familiar discourse or informal conversations, which adds nothing to the clarity or the rapidity of transmission of thought. However, in the midst of all the prolixity and verbiage occur striking Christian statements and illuminating opinions such as those of an element of heat and of sound. Boyle's scientific writings have three distinct components. First, the traditional. It is the result of reading a great variety of authors. The second, or experimental, is the outcome of Boyle's own researches and those of his assistants in the laboratory. The third component is a mass of information and at times misinformation acquired as a result of conversation or correspondence with many people. Boyle described as navigators, travelers, and indeed credible persons, men of every occupation and rank. The extent of Boyle's reading can only be judged from the references and acknowledgments in his texts and unpublished materials, because unfortunately, Boyle's library was never catalogued and was sold piecemeal after his death. So we cannot be sure of the bulk of his literary sources. However, on the point of references and acknowledgments in his text, he is, in my view, generous and fair. If references are omitted, the reasons were stated. Others have been since deduced by the editors of the recent edition of the works of Robert Boyle. Boyle gave references in a surprisingly modern manner. Here, the book, the chapter, and indeed the page. In some cases, the reference has have a little note, Paj Mihi, to indicate in my copy, sometimes abbreviated to P dot M dot. Boyle's scientific studies fell mainly into the areas of physics, chemistry, and some aspects of medicine. His contribution in physics was through his studies on gases, heat, thermometry, light and colors, and the accurate density measurements, and to a lesser extent, on magnetism and electricity. Might be interesting for you to know that Boyle wrote the first monograph in the English language on electricity. His first scientific publication, published in 1660, after six years work in Oxford, was New Experiments Physico-Mechanical Touching the Spring of the Air, made for the new part with a uh, pneumatical engine. And you can see this sitting uh, at the side. Of this. With this engine or air pump, Boyle showed that air transmitted sound had weight. The book also described chemical experiments, which were would some work in a vacuum and some would not such as the demonstration that the candle needed air to continue burning. This book helped to popularize the experimental approach to science. It was a scientific work that everybody could understand. However, shortly after publication, a few criticisms emerged amongst the otherwise very generous praise given by scientists worldwide. One scholar in particular, Franciscus Linus, a Belgian professor of physics in Liège, offered an entirely different explanation why the mercury stays up in a barometer tube. Linus claimed that an invisible cord or funiculus drew the mercury up and that the rise had nothing to do with the external air. Now Boyle decided that the best way to answer Linus would be by experiments rather than by long letters to scientific journals. During the experiments, Boyle discovered the inverse relationship between the pressure and volume of a gas contained by mercury within a tube. These experiments were published in an appendix uh, annexed to the reprint. This is the engine. And this is one year later. And here we have the appendix to the new experiments. Now, a current good copy of the first edition of the new experiments is about 3,000 pounds. 
The second edition, the last one on the market, was £35,000. Now, this is an unusual event in the antiquarian book trade, and it's due to the second edition containing Boyle's Law and the material to support it. For the sceptical chemist, the normal rule, the first being more valuable than the second, applies, current prices being about 48,000 and about 9,500 respectively. Now, since most people have never seen Boyle's Law data, and since it has recently been su suggested in, indeed, the Dune issue of Chemical World, that Boyle might have fiddled his results, <laughs> here are the results for the compression experiments. And if you look at the, the V and E columns, you'll see just random variation between them. And one is the observation, and the other is the calculated on an inverse relationship. These look perfectly random to me. And if you look, I haven't got it up here, the compression data, it, it works equally well. Now, the sceptical chemist, and this is the second edition, was at one time regarded as a landmark and Boyle's most significant contribution to the advancement of all human learning. It has been misrepresented, misunderstood, and largely unread as it is one of the most repetitive and tedious of Boyle's publications. Far from repudiating alchemy, the sceptical chemist cites alchemical texts and theories to criticize chemical pharmacists, artisan chemists, and textbooks writers. He described these as vulgar chemists. Boyle's goals were to question some of the current chemical theories to make chemical practitioners more philosophical, less commercially focused, and to raise chemistry's status. In his day, chemistry was held in low esteem. It had no places in the universities. Its practice was dirty, smelly, and laborious. The book is best considered as an examination of the analysis of materials by fire, written at the time of transition from artisan chemistry and alchemy to chemistry in its more modern sense. In Boyle's time, the composition of materials was described in terms of the four Aristotelian elements, earth, air, fire, and water, with the associated properties of hot, cold, dry, or moist to which was added by Paracelsus three principles, the tria prima, those of sophic mercury, sophic sulfur, and sophic salt. Boyle was aware of several earths, airs, and inflammable materials, which called into question the universality of the four plus three element theory. Boyle made considerable progress in distinguishing between mixtures and compounds and his attempts to understand the simpler chemical entities from which compounds could be constructed. Probably the best known sentence in the sceptical chemist is Boyle's opinion of an element. I quote, and to prevent mistakes, I must advertise you that I mean by elements, as those chemists speak plainest do by their principles, certain primitive and simple or perfectly unmingled bodies, which, not being made of any other bodies or of one another, are the ingredients of which all those called perfectly mixed bodies are immediately compounded and into which they are ultimately resolved. Now, to the modern reader, this might imply that Boyle had a clear notion of an element in a sense understood today. Not so. Boyle was well on the road to such an understanding, but he never quite arrived at it. As Lawrence Princip has recently remarked, it can be said of books, as Shakespeare said of people, some are born great, some achieve greatness, and some have greatness thrust upon them. The skeptical chemist falls in the last category. It could be said that Boyle was not quite skeptical chemists. Boyle's made many contributions to the advancement of chemical and physical methods of analysis. 
His main contribution to physical methods was by devising methods for the accurate measurement of specific gravities of solids, liquids, uh, and a whole range of quite difficult circumstances. Boyle's analysis to contributions to the analysis of solutions were concerned with acid-base indicators, reagents and reactions for specific substances, and their limits of detection. And in the systematic examination of mineral waters and of human blood. Although many reactions have been known earlier, he studied them in greater depth, as described in his text on colors. This is his textbook on colors and in his two analytical texts. Boyle was the first to describe a fluorescent acid base indicator. This is extract of lignum nephriticum. He also described an inorganic indicator, the cupramine ion. Boyle was particularly fond of the use of lignum nephriticum and described the effects of concentration, acidity, angle of viewing on the serverless blue color. The principal fluorescent component has been identified by myself and colleagues as 7-hydroxy 2-4-5 trimethoxy isoflavone. Boyle's small text on mineral waters is one of his more readable books. It is divided into 30 chapters and more detailed and a considerable advance of those of earlier workers. In it, in addition to a range of qualitative tests, he described the first quantitative colorimetric analysis for iron in water, namely in Tunbridge water, Tunbridge Wells water, by reaction with extract of oak galls. Boyle was innovative because he assayed his standards gravimetrically. His result expressed in terms of iron oxide it was in terms of compounds at this stage because the elemental uh, wasn't, theory wasn't fully worked out. He got 4.56 grains per gallon, which is consistent with later figures for this. His small text on uh, human blood, natural history of human blood, is regarded as the first manual of biochemical analysis and is written in the same style as mineral waters. Boyle noted clearly the presence of iron in blood. The dry residue after distillation, or the caput mortem, or terum damnata, in the language of the times, had a fine red color, just like the colcasa of iron. His detection of chloride was by the white precipitate with solution of silver silver nitrate, exactly as you would do it today. But this test was backed up by an additional and most elegant and indeed a very selective reaction. He floated some gold leaf on aquafortis, concentrated nitric acid. He then added the powdered salt obtained from the pyrolyzed blood residue to it, which was then turned into aqua regia and did in a trice totally dissolve it. That's a seriously selective and interesting reaction. Now throughout Boyle's lifetime, his interests were divided between science and theology. He was careful not to mix one with the other, although many of his theological works have illusions and arguments drawn from natural history and from science. Boyle's publications on moralistic, theological, and utopian writings are less well known these days, yet at the time were significant and comprised about a third of his written output. His first book, predating Spring and Weight of the Air by One Year, was Some Motives and Incentives to the Love of God, published in 1659. This is known in the trade as seraphic love because the running title used in all the 17th century editions have that 
portrays seraphic love above each page. It was in his day a best seller. It appeared in 12 English editions, one Latin, one German, and one in French. In the Advertisement to the reader, a, prophet, a preface in modern terms, Boyle gave a, a revealing apology, apologia. He wrote, the former papers, brackets, written in a compliment to a fair lady, Cl close the bracket, and the quotes, this lady has been identified by some, as, some people as Anne Howard, to whom the Earl intended a match with his son. So keen was the Earl that a second ring was given in 1642, in addition to the one already mentioned, given in 1641. In Boyle's will, written 40 years later, he bequeathed a ring to his sister. I quote, a ring worn for many years for a particular reason, not unknown to my dear sister. This is probably the ring that was returned to him in his youth. Boyle never married, despite numerous attempts to provide a wife for such a wealthy bachelor. The style of the scriptures published in 1661 was his first devotional work and is a remarkable forerunner of modern higher criticism which is usually said to have begun nearly a century later with Jan Ustruck in 1753. Boyle compared the Gospels in a truly logical manner, commenting on the incongruities, but emphasizing their essential harmony. It has been reprinted eight times in English, three times in Latin, and once in Swedish. A few months after publication of the style of the scriptures, the king appointed him as governor of the company for the propagation of the gospel among the heathen nations of New England and other parts of America. Boyle supported financially the translation of the Bible into numerous languages, including Native American dialects, Malayan, Arabic, and Irish Gaelic. For the latter, the production of a fresh font of type was necessary, and this was paid for by Boyle. The, the authorship of one of the most contentious of the anonymous uh, tracts ascribed to Boyle, known as Protestant and Papist, was published in 1687. This was revisited in 2007 at the Sixth International Conference on the History of Chemistry held in Leuven. The attribution of this book to Boyle owes its origin to an early entry in the British Museum catalogue, which is continued to this day. And in the web catalogue of digital facsimile books, Ebo, Early English Books Online. The authorship was taken up by Edward Davis in 1994, who concluded that the author was David Abercrombie, a one-time literary assistant of Boyle. This attribution was criticized violently by Raymond Tumbleson in 1996 and indeed in 1998. Davis had searched for copies of the tract with any contemporaneous annotations naming possible authors, but found none that gave the attribution to David Abercrombie. However, I found just such a copy. And we'll just home in, and this is the bottom of the thing. And this is uh, on the copy of the corrected issue of the first edition, and it's been annotated twice on the title page, both in an early hand and early ink. Alongside a person of quality is written R. Boyle, which was then overwritten Mr. David, and beneath Abercrombie, formerly a Jesuit. That it was not written by Boyle is, in my view, supported by the layout and structure of the tract, which has features not found in the other anonymous works which are now attributed to Boyle. Furthermore, the well-documented details of Boyle's relationships and friendships and people across the whole 
Judeo-Christian spectrum clearly demonstrates his lack of religious bigotry. Firstly, I'd like to talk about Boyle's knowledge of scholars and scholarship in Europe. Boyle acquired considerable knowledge about the various parts of Europe and their scholarship from five sources. His grand tour and a later visit to the Netherlands. His reading, books and journals of the period. Thirdly, his correspondence received from Europe. Four, inquiries for composing a good natural history of a country which was put out via philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. And fifthly, his visitors from Europe and those of England who had traveled into Europe. The bulk of correspondence to and from Boyle is now readily available in the recent edition of the correspondence of Robert Boyle. The problem resulting from the absence of a catalogue of Boyle's library has already been noted. Some of the answers to the inquiries came to Boyle directly, others went to Henry Oldenburg, the secretary of the Royal Society, and then on to Boyle. Madison, who used to be the librarian in the sister society, Astronomical Society, across the square there, uh, was a, a great student of Boyle and he produced very good accounts of Boyle's foreign visitors, those who left records of their visits, that is. Some countries stand out particularly in the amount of information Boyle knew about their scientists and scientific matters. Accounts have been published for Hungary with respect to the mines and mineral waters and chemicals, and on a wider range of topics for uh, Boyle and Spain and for Italy. Boyle's knowledge of Europe uh, is, in a sense, the study of the spread of chemistry between the nations of Europe is a topic of particular interest to the division of analytical chemistry of the European Society of Chemistry and Molecular Sciences and has been discussed in many lectures on the history of chemistry in the host nations at the Euroanalysis series of conferences. Boyle's contribution to chemistry at the pan-European level has been referred to in many of these lectures and their subsequent publications. Europe acquired knowledge of Boyle and his scholarly activities in a similar manner to how Boyle acquired his knowledge of the European scholars and scholarship, namely from meetings during his travels in Europe, Boyle's letters to residents in Europe, his visitors from Europe, and those from Britain who traveled in Europe. The European imprints of his books, and in one case, extended abstracts in European reviews of science and copies of his works in private and public European libraries. Although Boyle's record of the Grand Tour contains details of the sites seen, his studies, his recreations, he made no mention of the names of the people he met. On a later visit to the Netherlands, he only recorded that he met Menasseh ben Israel, of whom he said, the greatest rabbi of his age. And he mentions him several times and his opinions in, in scattered throughout the works. One of his visitors from Europe stands out from the rest, Count Lorenzo Magalotti. Magalotti was an important link between the Accademia del Cimento in Florence and the Royal Society in London, and was also a close friend of Boyle. During Magalotti's second visit to London in 1669, he was taken ill with a fever, and its effect lasted nearly four months. During this illness, Boyle visited and sat at his bedside for two to three hours daily. Magalotti and Boyle had many interests in common, but differed on only one point, namely the practice of religion. Magalotti, despite considerable efforts, failed to convince Boyle of the merits of Roman Catholicism. However, this did not impair their friendship, which was lifelong. During Boyle's lifetime, Latin 
editions of his publications were produced piecemeal in England or in the Netherlands prior to a systematic approach by Samuel de Tonnes of Geneva. De Tonnes was a major bookseller and it was probably to solve the problem of erratic supplies that he produced his own editions of Boyle's and other notable authors. Now, most of the Detourne's editions of Boyle appear in two versions, one as from Geneva. The other one is from a mythical place, Colonia Alabrogum. The reason for the two versions was commercial, due to the fact that at the time, a Geneva imprint was regarded as a sign of heretical literature in Catholic countries, and hence could not be imported. So he solved his problem. Unfortunately yet, I've not managed to have matched, acquired a matched pair of Geneva uh, and uh, Colonia once. Keep looking. Much information about Boyle's problems and views on the Dutch booksellers is available via the correspondence between Boyle and Henry Oldenburg. For example, in December 1667, Boyle wrote, whereas two books of mine have recently been printed in Holland, viz. Physiological Essays and the book on colors, without any notice taken as I informed that they were ever printed in England or as much translated out of the English. Now, despite Boyle's disapproval, I like to collect them. They're not vastly expensive, they're quite small, they don't take up too much book space, and they have some interesting frontispieces. Here we have the first Latin skeptical chemist, very pretty. Here we have the spring and weight of the air, and you'll notice it has the defense, so this is the second edition for, to, to Linus. And here we have a rubricated title page, uh, and this is the very book that uh, uh, the reprint, the parrot reprint that Boyle was complaining about to Oldenburg. Now the importance of Boyle's texts to scholars on mainland Europe and to the continental book trade can be judged that 25 out of 30 of Boyle's natural philosophical or scientific works appeared in continental Latin editions and three of these in other languages. Of his other works, the religious moralistic utopian, only four of the 10 have Latin imprints and three in other languages. The relative proportions reflect Boyle's status as one of the major contribution to contributors to the then new experimental approach to science. A considerable number of previously unrecorded citations and versions of Boyle's works in Dutch have been located last year in a composite set of the Cabinet de Nachtelich Historian, which was edited by William Ranuf. And that is the print of, of the, the engine, which is almost an exact copy of Boyle's original, except it's reversed, because they took it, engraved it, and when you print it, it'll come the other way round. We can look at the two pictures side by side there. The items in the eight volumes of the cabinet have been correlated with the original items as given in works. The focus of the materials is on Boyle's work on gases, pharmaceutical and medical items as a result of the editor's particular interest in barometric pressure measurements and his professional training uh, uh, in medicine. This find raises the question of what other Boyle's materials remain to be discovered in other such publications. We can keep looking. The location of Boyle's copies in overseas libraries are a further source of information about the various countries' knowledge of Boyle. Fulton's bibliography of Boyle outlines his holdings in the United Kingdom, in America, and Copenhagen, Paris, and Uppsala. Since then, the holdings in the Dutch libraries 
and the Academy of Sciences Library in Moscow have been fully documented. Recent researches of the online catalogues of the older Italian universities, the National and the Vatican libraries have revealed 147 individual items of early copies of Boyle's works and compilations. Copies of some of them are held in more than 10 locations. Most, but not all, are in Latin, mainly the Digitonus reprints. If the early copies in the current holdings were obtained soon after publication, the high numbers fit in very nicely with the attitude displayed by the members of the Academia di Cimento to the work of Boyle and his contemporaries in the Royal Society in London. In addition to Boyle's influence in Europe, one must mention that Boyle achieved a great influence amongst the American colonists and numerous correspondents kept him informed of their affairs, sent him news of scientific wonders and strange events. The president and fellows of Harvard were selected by Boyle to deal with the execution of some of the items in Boyle's will. Leonard Hoare, one time president of Harvard, was a close friend of Boyle's, as was the first Harvard graduate to achieve a reputation in chemistry namely George Sturck, sometimes called George Starkey. Hoare deserves a special place in the history of chemistry in America, for in a letter in 1672 to Boyle, he outlined his plans for the development of Harvard to include, I quote, a laboratory for those philosophers that by their senses would culture their understanding. Our, in our design, to spend their time of recreation in them for reading or notions only are but husky provender. However, the laboratory was not built and throughout the 17th century, there appears to be no formal instruction in chemistry, although several chemical-based theses were presented at Harvard. Although little is in intact of the locations of Boyle's London home, his places of work, of discussion, and of worship, a tour of London is not unrewarding. In addition to living at his sister's house in Pall Mall, Boyle had a retreat in the city called My Dwelling House in St. Michael Crooked Lane. The, proceedings, the, the proceeds of the sale of the lease were left in his will to fund the Boyle lectures. Boyle was a founder member of the Royal Society and a frequent attender at their meetings. The first home of the Royal Society from 1660 to 1720 was in the premises of Gresham College in the city. This college was founded in 1597. It was housed in Sir Thomas Graham's, Gresham's former mansion in Bishopgate, now demolished, now occupied by the Nat West Tower. Boyle was familiar by family visits to the original Burlington House, as it was from 1667, the London seat of his elder brother, Richard, the first Earl of Burlington. As noted earlier, Boyle made numerous contributions to the analysis of mineral waters, including those of Tunbridge Wells and others closer, in or closer to or in London. These included the wells at Epsom, Acton, Dulwich, Barnet, Hampton, and three wells in Islington, including that of the music house, Mr. Sadler's Wells. And that's uh, referred in the little book on mineral waters. Possibly the most interesting site is that in Maiden Lane Covent Garden, where the first commercial manufacture of phosphorus was carried out in a laboratory known as the Golden Phoenix. In the past, this has been commonly assumed to boil, to be Boyle's lab. It was, however, set up by Boyle's operator or technician, Ambrose Godfrey Hankovitz in 1707, despite the date of 1680, carved under the Golden Phoenix on the front of the building. Hankovitz obtained two building leases two adjoining plots of land from the Bedford Estate in 1706, 
one on the west side in Southampton Row, the other on the south side in Maiden Lane. In Southampton Row, he built a house. On the other plot, he built a large laboratory. The date 1680 refers to the date of the discovery by Boyle, assisted by Hankerbits, of a method that gave high yields of elemental phosphorus. This was a landmark event in Hankovitz's career. With the passage of time, it appears that this date has been interpreted as the date of the foundation of the business, and as such has appeared on the bill heads and on the trademark uh, on medical devices by Godfrey and Cook in the 19th century. Several illustrations exist which traditionally represent the interior of the Golden Phoenix. The best is that given by Joseph Inst in his article on the old firm of Godfrey. After leaving Boyle's service sometime in 1683, Hankovitz set up in business as a manufacturing, analytical and consulting chemist. He had the virtual monopoly of the manufacture of phosphorus because of his mastery of the process and was proud to be able to produce seven to eight ounces at one distillation. Having mentioned Hankovitz several times, perhaps you should have a look at him. This is an engraving by virtue uh, and the Latin motto, the kingdoms of nature like the phoenix revived by means of the fire is uh, Uh, here we have the golden phoenix arising, and here we have the sticks of uh, white or yellow phosphorus, uh, which was, again, advertising his business. Ambrose Godfrey Hankovich normally used his last surname, except on formal documentation when he used Godfrey Hankovich. His sons, Ambrose and Boyle, dropped Hankovich and adopted Godfrey as their sole surname. The business passed to a nephew, Ambrose Godfrey, son of Boyle Godfrey, who took a partner, Gorman Cook, around 1795. The Southampton house became the shop, surmounted by the stone golden phoenix and the date 1680. The business became more pharmaceutical and in character and remained on that site until 1862 when the business moved to the West End. When the old laboratory was ultimately pulled down, it was to provide a site for the Roman Catholic Church of Corpus Christi, which opened in 1874. Now this church is well worth a visit in its own right. It's a very pretty little church. However, if you have a good imagination, you can reverse the transmutation as described by Joseph Inch, and thus additionally visit the Golden Phoenix Laboratory. It is also highly likely that Boyle had a laboratory in Covent Garden himself, in addition to that in Pall Mall. This can be deduced from Boyle's description of the transport of phosphorus from a site well away from Pall Mall, given in his book, The Icy Nightlight, because it glows in the dark, yellow phosphorus. A passage in this book shows a rare example of Boyle's less serious side. It reads, the same labyrinth who was very helpful to me in varying the preparation of the phosphorus had a worse adventure not long after. I have to say earlier, his hair had caught fire in an experiment with gunpowder and phosphorus. But anyway, he was bringing some newly distilled grains of the Noctiluca covered with the shining water that came over with it. He unluckily broke the glass in his pocket, whereupon the heat of his body, increased by the motion of his long walk put into it, did excite the matter that had fallen out of the broken file, and it burned two or three great holes in his breeches before he could come to me to relate his misfortune, the recent effects of which I could not look upon without some wonder as well as smiles. That's the only humor I found. Now let us turn to some more observable connections with Boyle in London, namely the portraits of uh, 
Boyle in London. Several portraits of Boyle are available to view. An original by Johann Kurzboom showing Boyle in court dress hangs in the council room of the Royal Society. They also have a portrait attributed to John Reilly, which is on the ground floor opposite the main staircase. You can see that one easily. The National Portrait Gallery has two early Kurzboom style portraits, one of which is normally on view. The Wellcome Historical Medical Museum also has a Kurzboom style in oils. The Kurzboom portraits are the basis of most of the etching port and, uh, portraits of Boyle. The Royal Society of Chemistry, in common with other professional bodies, has acquired portraits of their past presidents, as well as famous exponents of their subject areas. A portrait of Boyle in a dressing gown and velvet cap hangs in the room behind, in the council room. This is attributed to Jonathan Richardson and was purchased by the then Institute of Chemistry in 1931. When you look at that portrait, it bears a close likeness to the portrait of his sister I showed you earlier. In the council room is also a Wedgwood and Bentley blue jasper high white relief portrait produced around about 1775. I was going to say now you've all walked past the marble bust in the entrance hall of the Royal Society of Chemistry and how many have you ever looked at it? Of course it is no longer there, it is sitting here at the moment because of the building works. Now the history of, of this uh, bust is quite interesting. A private collector acquired through the antiques trade what was described as a handsome 18th century bust. No attribution, no nothing. Later, this was recognized as similar to the bust of Boyle in the Royal Collection, which at the time was attributed to Reisbach. The bust in the Royal Collection, along with others, was commissioned by Queen Caroline for her grotto or hermitage at Richmond in the period 1732 to 1733. It has been long well known, discussed by Madison, its reproduced as the frontispiece to the second edition of Fulton's bibliography of Boyle, in both cases attributed to Johannes Michael Reisbrach. Following researches by Giometti into the works of Giovanni Battista Guelfi, both busts are now attributed to Guelfi. The copy here was originally at Lord Burlington's Palladian Villa Richmond House. It is well documented that Guelphy did much work for Lord Burlington. This copy came to the Chelminsky Gallery in London from a private collection, was part of their Sculpture Masterworks exhibition in 2002, prior to the purchase by the Royal Society of Chemistry, because they didn't purchase it at the price it went at auction as an unknown item. Once it's documented, the value rises rather rapidly. Now the attribution to both copies rests on the entry in the records of the Office of Works for the bust in the Royal Collection. This is normally on a pillar. Here is a, a, a little work that was going on when we had to visit to, to look at the, 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 the works, uh, uh, record of public works, and we verified that uh, it, it is indeed wealthy. Because here you can read, for a busto of the Honorable Robert Boyle in statuary marble on the neck of veined marble for carriage and repairing the antique statue of Venus. And uh, that, that, that's the same as this, except this, this is the original sockle and the Queen's one has got a round sockle that was replaced at a, a later. The only difference between the two copies is in the sockles, the support. The Royal Collection copy was placed on a round sockle in the 1820s when it was moved to Windsor. It's apparently now in Kensington Palace. The bust in Burlington House retains exactly as it was made on its 18th century square base sockle. 
In the exhibition is another example of a boil item not recognized by the antique trade prior to its acquisition by a sharp-eyed collector. It is an oil and copper portrait of a young image of Boyle, which has been restored by the experts at the National Portrait Gallery. It's recently been exhibited at the Royal Society and indeed the Royal Irish Academy. Now, there are, in conclusion, I'd like to just outline some of the current commemorations of Robert Boyle. Boyle is commemorated in two lecture series. The first was founded by Boyle himself under the terms of his last will and testament. It's an annual series of lecture sermons that commenced in 1692. The first was given by Richard Bentley, a copy for you to look at. The Oxford University Junior Scientific Club instituted another series of lectures in 1892, and Sir, Sir William Ackland gave the inaugural lecture in that series. Three medals carry Boyle's name. The oldest medal is that of the Royal Dublin Society, first given in 1899 to Johnson Stoney of Electron fame. The next is the Robert Boyle Gold Medal of the Analytical Division. It was restricted to overseas candidates and was first awarded in 1982 to Sir Alan Walsh. It has been recently combined with the SAC Gold Medal, which had the same rubrics with regard to qualifications of scientific merit, but was restricted to candidates in UK and Ireland to produce one open senior analytical division award. Following the institution of the analytical Robert Boyle Gold Medal, the SAC Gold Medalists were also given a Robert Boyle Gold Lapel Pin to stress the equivalence of these two awards. The images on the medal and the pin are based on copies of Kersboom style images given in Birch's edition of the collected works. The most recent medal is the Boyle Higgins Gold Medal of the Institute of Chemistry in Ireland, which was first awarded in 1990. There have also been postage stamps with Boyle's image, uh, both in the Republic of Ireland and in the uh, United Kingdom. Uh, the Boyle stamps for, for the United Kingdom were to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the Royal Society. In conclusion, I'd like to make some serious acknowledgements. First of all, my wife, for her constant support and encouragement. Only two weeks ago, she encouraged me to add to my Boyle collection when I was maybe havering when I was looking at the uh, a second edition of Spring and Weight of the Air, which has been a desire for many years. I'd like to thank the Analytical Division of the Royal Society of Chemistry for their support in my Division of Analytical Chemistry, UCHEM activities, and the Queen's University of Belfast, in particular the Science Library staff in the Maclay Library, who have been uh, uh, great supporters, and indeed, for a number of years, I was resident in the Science Library as a, a grace and favor tenant. I also have to thank the Royal Society of London because they have lent us certain display materials and indeed the Heritage Centre in uh, Lismore, uh, which is County Warford, Waterford, where his birthplace is. Thank you. Well, thank you, Duncan, for that wonderful evocation of a, a truly remarkable man. Uh, Duncan has agreed to answer questions, uh, and while you're thinking of them, I I'm just would like to say that uh, thinking that he described the skept this skeptical chemist as, as the most tedious and repetitive volume that one has to read, I can only speculate that one of my PhD students used this as a model for, for his uh, first draft of his thesis. So, the floor is open for questions. Anyone uh, want to uh, ask, ask a question? 
Could you say who you are and where you're from, please? Right. Uh, Mike Jones, I'm a member of the Water Council Centre of Coral Group. Um, there's, a, there's a microphone on its way here, because we're recording this. Right. right. Um, what was the process he used for making phosphorus? Originally, it's been obtained from urine, and Hugh Aldersley Williams recently tried to do that and couldn't get it to work. <laughs> so, what, so, what did Boyle do? So, what did Boyle do? And his. I think it's well enough documented that it does work and I think thermodynamically you could show it was. Any other questions? I, I've got one and that's uh, about the fluorescent indicator. I mean, yes. How did he discover that? I mean, is it visible fluorescence or he couldn't have had an instrument to, to, no. to see it? So. Uh, now then, the, the lignum nephriticum, lignum nephriticum was imported from, in, from the new world when all the new sort of uh, quinine and so on was being imported. And uh, it was used, lignum nephriticum uh, indicates that it has a kidney effect. It's a, if you extract the wood, it's a diuretic. And uh, there's a little wooden cup there. If you fill that with water and leave it overnight at your bedside table, you'll find in the morning when the sunlight comes on it, it's got a lovely blue visible fluorescence. You then quaff it quickly uh, and all is well with you. But it was used as a medicament and he noticed that when, when it was acidified, the fluorescence disappeared. It's a very sharp uh, color indicator and he used this to, uh, uh, he didn't know about PKs and so on, but he was interested in acids, alkalis, and so on, and it was a fairly straightforward indicator to give him something was acidic or not acidic. And he describes it in many places, in, and he used it in uh, the uh, mineral water examination and the like. If you want to see the same effect, you can get exactly that by looking at a bottle of tonic water. Yes. Uh, and of course, it, it becomes much more palatable if you add a non-fluorescent uh, material to it. Uh, <laughs> at the right time of day. Yeah. But it's very visible in, in, in fluorescence. And it has sort of a sky blue colour, a severless blue colour. Exactly. Any more questions? Yes? No? One here. Michael Batchelor, can I ask a biographical question? Um, was his sister an intellectual companion to him? As far as we know, she mainly kept house and saw to him. There's no, I don't think there's any evidence that she was actually intellectually involved. Mm. You will excuse an advert because uh, the inaugural Robert Boyle uh, Science Festival is in Lismore this autumn. And if you haven't been to see Lismore, this is the centre and this is a heritage centre, uh, which is the old courthouse, which, of course, they don't have. They've re reorganised all the courts in the Republic, and they use less of them, but rather larger buildings, uh, so they don't spread them around quite so much. Is that an international Eurochemistry event? Uh, it, it, that, uh, the, my, I, I'm lecturing there, and that's sponsored by the uh, Royal Society of Chemistry in Northern Ireland. It's sponsored by the Republic of Ireland section. It's also sponsored by the Royal Irish Academy. So yeah. it's a triple, triple headed billing that one mm. when it comes off. But they are well aware it is the International Year of Chemistry. Well, I ask because one of the events in IYC that we've done this year, uh, across the world in fact, is to get children from uh, all over the world to measure water quality. Uh, and I kind of think we just missed a trick that we could have gone to all of these locations where Boyle had his water from and uh, tied it on to, uh, to, 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 to Boyle's 350th anniversary of this book. However, we do have something to celebrate in that 
uh, more British children have taken part in this experiment than any other country in the world, and so uh, we're very pleased about that. So, well done, Pauline. Uh, Ivan Atanasov, King's College. Uh, how much of a coincidence is it that uh, Waterford, where they made the glass, uh, helped in his experimentation in the uh, glassware that he used? Hard to say, but glass was glass workings were. Uh, he he described uh, they, they weren't when he was in Ireland. He he, said, he comments that he is forced to make medical experimentation for he lacks glasses and furnaces wherewith to make chemical experimentation. So the amount of glassware that was about what was obviously quite expensive and it would be quite useful to him. And there were lots of glass works in London. But it's, uh, soda, gla it's soda glass, mm -hmm. which as you all well, are well aware, uh, doesn't uh, stand thermal shock quite as well as the borosilica that we, we, most of us <laughs> did our work with. Soda, soda glass apparatus is not the easiest thing to work with. It's too soft. It's also soluble, of course. Do we have any more questions? Well, in that case, uh, I'll try and wind things up. Uh, I think we've been treated to a, a remarkable um, history of a, of a remarkable man. Uh, I didn't say in my introduction of, of Duncan uh, that he actually holds an MA in history as well as his other qualifications. And I think he has ably demonstrated that tonight. And I'd like you to join me in thanking him again for a wonderful lecture. <laughs> I should say that the, there are two exhibition cases here of uh, memorabilia of, of, of Robert Boyle, and they, they all belong to Duncan Thorburn Burns. So do have a look at them before you go. And there are further refreshments outside. Thank you very much. <laughs>